So Hebrews chapter 8, William read the whole chapter for us earlier, but um, we're going to spend a, a couple weeks in, um, maybe a little longer than that, um, in, in, in this chapter. Um, I, there, there's just a lot in this chapter. It doesn't sound like it. It's only 13 verses, right? So it's, but there's so much, because then we have to go back to Jeremiah. Like, there, there's, a, there's a lot here. So we're going to spend a good portion of July in this chapter. But for tonight, let's start, and I'll read the first six verses of Hebrews chapter 8. It says, now the point in what we are saying is this. And let's stop there, because how often does the Scripture say, here's the point? Right, like, like so often in Scripture, we're digging and we're diving and we're trying to figure it all out. And here we've been reading Hebrews for, you know, six months. And we've read through seven chapters. And now we get to chapter eight and he says this. Now the point in what we are saying is this. So we should really be paying attention to this, right? We have such a high priest. One who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven a minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly thing. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. So before we even pray, just this is going to take weeks, right? It's going to take weeks. But here, here's what we have just in these verses. A better covenant, a better priest, and better promises. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that there is just wealth in every word that you breathe. Thank you that someone wrote this, but you breathed it. And God, so in some ways, thank you that we don't know who wrote this letter so that we don't have to try to debate what he was saying or wasn't saying. But instead, we just let your spirit teach us what he was breathing. And so tonight, God, I pray as we do so often, Holy Spirit, teach us your word. In the same way that you anointed someone to write this, anoint us to read it, anoint us to hear it, anoint us to believe it, and anoint us to obey it. And if you're willing, even anoint us to understand it. But thank you, God, that we can believe and obey even before we understand. And so I pray that your word would have its way in our lives and in our hearts, whatever your way is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So tonight, to rightly go forward into chapter 8 that we've just read, we need to go back a bit into chapter 7. Because chapter 7 was big, and there's some stuff that purposely just got set aside just a little bit, because I think there's some things we need to hear from chapter 7 that fold into chapter 8. Two weeks ago, we talked about chapter 7, verse 11. The fact that perfection was not attainable through the Levitical priesthood, but perfection is God's desire for us. God created us to be perfect. Verse 11 says that we are not perfect as we were created to be. But then you get to the end of the chapter. Verse 28 says that Jesus has been made perfect forever. So if we put the chapter together, the, the, the opening and the closing, what God desires for us is in Jesus. Which means that the only way for us to ever be what we were created to be is for us to be in Christ. And for Christ, by the Holy Spirit, to be in us. We will never know who we are. We will never know why we are here. We will never know where we belong until we find ourselves in the one who made us for the purpose from which he made us. You cannot even know yourself unless you know your maker. 
all of our hope is found in Jesus. Perfection, as the Scriptures define it, means completion. And so two weeks ago, we defined it this way. Perfection is humility. It's submission and obedience. It's being exactly what God desires us to be by being fully dependent upon and content in Him. I want us to see tonight, even as we get started, that perfection is something that God desires for us, not something that He desires of us. It's something that He has provided as a gift, not something that He requires as a sacrifice. We cannot attain it, but we must yield to it. What God wants for us, we don't just see in Jesus. Jesus has made it available to us. So he's not just been perfect for us. He's inviting us to be perfect in him. Hang on to that. Chapter 7 tells us that Jesus is a better hope. And here's where I want us to really focus in. He's a better hope because he provides something better, something greater than anything and everything we have ever found ourselves hoping for. But hear this. It's not more, it's better. And there's a tremendous difference between the two, right? Some of us choose restaurants by getting the place that gives you more, right? Some of us pick it. You should see the portions. We may even say it's not that great, but you get so much food. When the reality is, right, it should make more sense to pay for something that's better, And when it's better, you don't need as much of it because it is better, right? And so Jesus is better. He's not more. He's not offering all the kingdoms of the earth. That's what the enemy offered. He's offering himself, which may not seem like more, but it is always better. If we're honest, a lot of our hopes are just based on us. A lot of our hopes for life are based on what we want, what we think, what we feel, mostly what we crave. A lot of our hopes are based on our flesh. Even our good hopes are often based on our flesh. We hope to be happy and healthy. We hope to have spouses and families, jobs that fulfill us and friends that surround us. We hope to have just enough money to be comfortable. I don't need to be rich. I just want to be comfortable. We hope to have just enough stability to feel secure, enough peace to not be anxious. We hope for long lives, a painless death, and eternity in heaven. Not one of those things is bad, but Jesus provides something far greater than any or all of those things. Hebrews 7.19 says this, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Here's our better hope. We can come near to God. Do we understand that before and without Jesus, we could not come close to God? Not the way that God desired and not the way that God designed us to come close to Him. To live in relationship with Him. He could come close to man. He could visit. He could even dwell in their midst. But we could not come close to actually dwell with God. There was a tent of meeting. There was a curtain that contained not only the Holy Spirit, but the mercy seat. So now we come boldly before the throne of grace, where that very throne used to be hidden behind a curtain. There's this difference that I don't even think we understand. There was blood required multiple times a day. And then there was an annual day of atonement. There was always a separation. In fact, here's how real the separation was. John chapter 1 verse 18 says, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is Himself God and is at the Father's side has made Him known. Guys, this means that Abraham, who was God's friend, didn't see God. It means that Jacob, who wrestled with God, never saw Him. That Moses, who spoke face to face with God the way a man does a friend, did not see God the way that God desired to be seen. 
It means that David, who was a man after God's own heart, never saw God. That Elijah and Elisha, Isaiah and Jeremiah, Daniel and Ezekiel, that none of the prophets who heard from God, who spoke for God, ever saw God. And yet what we don't often understand is we would love to have their lives, and yet we've been given a better life than any of them was ever given. We've been given something better, if not something more, and yet many of us would trade the better for the more, right? We would trade the the cloud we could see for the spirit who actually lives in us. We would trade some of these things that have passed away for the thing that never passes away. This means that no one could draw near to God the way that God desired and intended until Jesus came and became our priest and our sacrifice, until he paid for our sin and gave us his righteousness, until he defeated the grave and destroyed the devil, until he sat down at the Father's right hand and sent his spirit to live in us. We have been given a better hope. Let me ask this tonight. What do we think God desired in saving us? Right, because we generally talk about salvation in the terms of what we get from Him. But what about what He gets for Himself? Why did He save us? Why did he send Jesus? We read earlier from Psalm 100, right? It's not just that he would be our God, but that we would be his people. There's something that God has desired in salvation. We know that he sent Jesus out of his great love and his abundant compassion, out of his ever-increasing mercy. But again, why? What did God desire in and from our salvation? Isn't it made clear here in Hebrews 7? He desired that we would draw near to Him. We see the desire of God fulfilled when we turn to Revelation chapter 21, beginning in verse 3. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them as their God. So the whole story ends with what? Us with God. So everything built from the moment He made us until the moment that He returns for us for one thing, that we would be with God the way that God desires to be with us. That we would be in this relationship where there is no separation, where there is no divide. That we can come to Him the same way He comes to us. That there's no longer a curtain or a veil of any kind. If we keep reading in Revelation 21, it says there will be no temple in the New Jerusalem. Why? Because the Lamb will be there. In fact, it says there will be no sun because He will be our light. And the sun is always the life. So that means He is the light and He is the life. We will finally fully be dependent upon and submitted to Him. We won't need the sun because we will have Him. We won't need any of the things that we've needed because we couldn't get to Him. Because sin was in the way. I think that if we read Scripture fully, and I don't mean like read the whole Bible, I mean understanding that all of the Bible connects to each other, to itself, we begin to see God's discontent as it grows. Right? God grows weary of just walking with man in the cool of the day, of just dwelling with him in a tent or in a temple, of just holding his spirit behind a curtain and giving his mercy through a high priest once a year. He gets weary of the distance that sin created. And at just the right time, when we were still powerless, he would not settle any longer for a people held at arm's length. Christ died for the ungodly. See, our better hope is this. He wants us long before we wanted Him. He made a way for us when we didn't even know we needed a way to Him. He has desired us with the desire of His heart. And how how special must our hearts be in His if this is the lengths that He's gone to for us to know Him the way that He knows us. The better hope is the hope that God has always desired. That we would draw near to Him by His sending Jesus to live and die, resurrect and ascend, and eternally intercede for us. But it's not only a better hope. Chapter 7, verse 22 says, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. And we're going to talk about this for a couple weeks, but I'm just going to start it tonight. I don't know if we have any concept of this. 
This means that Jesus has brought us a better covenant than the one God made with Noah or the one God made with Abraham or with Israel through Moses. This is because Jesus was always the outcome, right? Jesus was always the promise. He was the fulfillment and the fruition of every other covenant that God has ever made. So that means the answer has always been Jesus. The promise was always Jesus. God's desire was always for us to draw near to him. And as Jesus said in John 14, he himself is the way. He's the way for us to come close to God. He's the way for us to live in Him, live through Him, live for Him, and live with Him. He is the way for God's desire for our lives to be fulfilled, the way for us to be perfect. Because once again, perfection is not the absence of error. Perfection is full dependence upon God. Listen to what Peter wrote about this better hope, this better covenant, this great salvation. 1 Peter chapter 1 says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicated was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things to which angels long to look. So let me, let me just try to paraphrase this just a little bit. Here's what Peter was saying. When Abraham was living in friendship with God, he was desiring to live where we are right now, right? That's what Hebrews 11 says. He was looking for a city whose maker is God. So when Abraham was carrying the promise, he would have rather carried the spirit. When Moses was speaking face to face with God the way a man does a friend, he desired to be living in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. When Daniel was having visions of the ancient of days, he longed to be living in relationship with Jesus. They all knew there was more. They all knew that there was a better hope and a better covenant, but they also knew that they were serving us. They knew that they were partners with God in the sending of the Messiah, that they would live with Him eternally, but they would not yet walk with Him in intimacy. So doesn't that mean that we have to come to grips with the fact that what God is doing in us may not be for us? Doesn't that mean that we have to come to grips that it's not about us? It's not us having everything we hoped for and everything we had planned and everything we wrote out, doesn't it? Don't we have to come to grips with the fact that if God was withholding from them for my sake, maybe he's withholding from me for somebody else's sake. And not only is that okay, that's part of the better covenant. It's part of the better promises because it comes from the better priest. So instead of making life about gathering what I want, I'm being used for him to scatter what he desires. What if what I call imperfection makes someone else perfect? Because isn't that the way God has always worked? In Jesus, we've been given so much more because Jesus is so much better. In fact, Peter says, even the angels, those who only know God's presence, who live around His throne and are sent out as His messengers, they long just to look into, just to see. The King James James says, just to peer at what we've been given. And yet, Hebrews 2 says, we easily drift. And it reminds us that we so often neglect this great salvation. I don't believe, and we'll get to this in in a few months, I don't believe the great cloud of witnesses is actually people surrounding us, cheering us on. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I don't think Moses and Abraham, I don't think they're paying any attention to us. But if they were, don't you think every once in a while they would go, we waited for this. Like we, we waited and this is how they're carrying this better covenant. We, we, like we, you held it back from us and they're holding back from you. Like the, even the angels who don't know redemption, who don't know what it is to be saved, who don't know what it is to have the blood of Christ spilled out for them, who don't know what it is to be adopted. Even the angels are looking going, can we just get a glimpse? Can we, can we just look into it? And it's been poured out into us. We have a better hope and a better covenant. 
Later we'll read how we have better promises and it's all because we have a better priest. Chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now the point and what we are saying is this, we have such a high priest as this. If you've got your Bible still open, go back again to chapter 7. Go back again to those last few verses starting in verse 26. We have a high priest who is holy in his relationship with God, who is innocent in his relationship with people, who is undefiled in his relationship with himself. We have a high priest who is separated from sinners altogether different and completely other. This means that Jesus, our great high priest, is right with God. He's pure in heart in his relationships to others. And his hands and his heart have been kept clean in his relationship to himself. He has been in the world, but never of the world. He has had a visible hope within him and an inexplicable joy and an unwavering confidence. Jesus is the model that kept getting asked the reason for the hope that was within him. Right? He's the model of the questionable life that, that creates questions for those that don't understand why he lives the way that he does. He was made like us, but at the same time, he lived differently from us. He was perfect in his humanity as we were intended to be, as God created us to be, as we can now be in him. Because again, perfection is not the absence of our weakness. It is our dependence upon God. So perfect is not try harder. Perfect is actually lean more. Right? Proverbs 3 is telling us how to be perfect. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge Him. And He will make your paths perfect. We're trying to fix problems and he wants us to lean in to his heart, to depend on him, to trust his sovereignty and his goodness and his faithfulness. We have a high priest, a better high priest. He has not turned from God. He has not turned on others and he has never turned to himself. We have a high priest who has never been selfish who has never been unkind, who has never been arrogant, who has never been lustful, who has never been dismissive. We have a high priest that didn't just die in his body, he crucified his flesh. And I don't know that we've ever spent enough time talking about this. Because if he was tempted on all counts, that means he had flesh like us, right? If he was a man, then he had flesh. So that means that before his body died, he crucified his flesh. He is perfect, dependent upon and obedient to God, thoughtful of and gracious to others, disciplined and consistent with himself. Because of his purity with God and with others and with himself, he's exalted above the heavens. Chapter 7 continues, He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. I think this is one of the most incredible truths about Jesus. He gave himself for us in death because he had kept himself from sin in life. Do we understand that if he had not resisted temptation, he could not have been our sacrifice? Right? We make it all about the cross. Had he sinned once, the cross means literally nothing. His sacrifice was not just the moment of the cross. It was every moment of temptation. Every time he chose righteousness, every time he chose humility, every time he chose obedience, he was saving us every time he didn't choose himself, every time he didn't complain, every time he didn't fight back, every time he didn't make room for his flesh, he was saving us because the cross would, have, would not have happened had he not resisted temptation. And we don't look at it that way because we make excuses for our own temptation rather than recognizing I could not be redeemed if he had not crucified his flesh. And so it's not that we were on his mind on the cross. We were on his mind every moment of his incarnation. Every time his, his body was tired. Every time he wanted to speak quickly. Every time he wanted to gather for himself. Every time the enemy came. He was crucifying his flesh so that his body could be crucified for hours. We don't think enough about the fact that Jesus lived for us long before he died for us. We are not simply saved because he died for our sin. We're saved because he lived without sinning and he did it for our sake. 
His obedience to the Father was out of love for Him, absolutely, but it was also out of love for us. He loved us from the beginning to the end. When Jesus offered Himself, His death could be applied to our account because He had chosen us in life long before He chose us in death. So let me ask this, just to try to apply it a little bit tonight. What if obedience to the Father is how we love one another? What if obeying the Scriptures, following the Holy Spirit, is how we belong to each other, how we are one body with many members, how we become we? Because we talk sometimes about obedience being costly. Disobedience. Disobedience will cost far more than obedience ever could. And it won't just cost the disobedient. It costs all of us. All of us. And so there's this point where we have to stop thinking about it's my relationship, it's personal, he's my personal savior. We are a body that is united, that is joined to each other. And so if Jesus' obedience leads to our salvation, then our obedience leads to our encouragement, to our being edified and built up as the body. What if the way Jesus lived for us is how we are called to live for Jesus and live with each other? He didn't just die in death. He died to the flesh in life. And that's what made His sacrifice acceptable. When was the last time we thanked Jesus for not sinning so that He could die for our sins? When was the last time when you were in your temptation that you slowed everything down and said, Jesus, thank you that when you were tempted exactly like this, you did not sin? Instead of making an excuse. This is why the author, and we'll get there, the author says, you have not yet resisted unto the point of bloodshed. What he's saying is no matter how hard you've tried, you have not tried as hard as Jesus yet. And I believe here's what he's saying. Keep trying. Keep trusting. Keep, keep walking in obedience. Because ultimately, isn't that what God desires for us? Didn't Jesus come not just to pay for our sin so we'd be forgiven, but to pay for our sins so we'd overcome? Isaiah 59, 2 says this, your iniquities have separated you from your God. If sin separates us from God, how can we continue to walk in sin and believe that somehow we're still walking with God? And yet we've all done it. Some of us might be doing it right here, right now. There might be what we, things that we call little or things that we refuse to even acknowledge our sin that we just have made part of who we are and part of what we do, and yet we still somehow think we're walking with God. Again, Isaiah 59, 2, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Now, I realize and I believe that sancti sanctification is a process. We are being saved. We are being sanctified. We are being changed. But isn't part of that process that we stop making room for sin? Don't we have to at some point not only ask for forgiveness, but actually repent, which is a turning of mind that is evidenced through a change of behavior. If all you changed was your mind and your behavior didn't change, guess what? Your mind has not changed. How do you know when your mind has changed? Your behavior is different. So instead of constantly saying, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, there's got to be a point where we say, change me, change me, change me. Don't we at some point have to obey Romans 13, 14 and put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no room for the flesh? If you know you are bent towards something, you can't keep making room for that thing and excusing that thing. If you know you are anxious, you've got to learn how to not make room for it and acknowledge it constantly. There's got to be a point where you say, teach me peace, teach me trust, teach me comfort. And it may take your whole life, but you're on top of it and you're holding on to it and you're saying teach me I don't want to acknowledge I don't want to claim this for myself I want to be what you created me to be don't we at some point believe in Jesus by becoming like Jesus don't we have to do what Colossians 3 9 and 10 commands and take off the old man and put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge and the in knowledge in the image of our creator like these are action words it doesn't say, and he will take off the old man, and he will put on the new man. It's a command. You take off the old man. You put on the new man. You stop making room for the flesh. You stop being the way you've always been and expecting God to just intercept you and somehow change everything without any dependence upon him at all. 
See, here's this hard thing tonight, guys. Jesus did not resist sin so we could walk in it. He resisted sin. He was tempted on all counts, yet without sin, so that we could be forgiven, redeemed, transformed, and so that we could overcome sin in our lives by living in the life of the Spirit. We have a high priest who is perfect forever so that he can make us perfect. But if we're going to be perfected, we're going to have to face our sin. Which means we're going to have to acknowledge it and we're going to have to confess it. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the high priest by His indestructible life. But we are the children of God for one reason and one reason only. By the redemption of Jesus. Without His perfection, we're doomed. Without His perfection, the Scripture says we're already condemned. It says that we are dead forever in the trespasses of our sins. If we're going to see Jesus as He is, we must also see ourselves as we are. You've heard me say this for years now. The presence of God reveals two things. God's character and our condition. To truly submit and surrender to God, we must have that moment, that experience where we see Him and know that He's too holy, He's too righteous, He's too perfect, and we don't belong here. And I'm not talking about that moment where we go, I don't want to go to hell. I mean that moment where we realize, I don't belong in God's presence. I don't belong where He's, that moment that Isaiah has, right? Where he says, I'm I'm, I'm ruined, I'm undone, I'm a, a man of unclean lips. Moses had that moment at the burning bush. Israel had that moment at Mount Sinai where they said, don't ever let God speak to us again. And you know what? When I read that, I struggle with Israel because I'm thinking, you know, they had this great opportunity. But twice God later says, they were right. They were right. They couldn't live in my presence like that. They could not, they could not endure my voice. But you know what he t- teaches in Deuteronomy? He says that because they were right about that, Moses says, I will send a prophet. God will raise up a prophet like me, and he will teach you all of God's ways, and you are to listen to him. So here's the thing. God spoke in power from a mountain. The people said, we can't do that. And God says, you're right, so I'll send Jesus. I'll send you a high priest who will crucify his flesh, who will make himself the sacrifice, and who will present me in the way that you need him to be presented. We have to have that moment in our lives where we see God and we see ourselves. I believe it is so necessary for salvation because it's that moment that we discover that we didn't come to God, that we didn't find Jesus, that we didn't pray a prayer that saved us. We weren't baptized and that changed everything. We weren't raised in the church and just always believed. But the holy, righteous, perfect God of creation came to us in our sinful state, came to us when we were already condemned, desired us when we were undesired. Desirable. If I don't realize he met me as a sinner, I will never rightly surrender to and worship him as my Savior. Have you seen yourself in light of him? Or are you still trying to present yourself in the light you want to be seen in? Because one of them leads to salvation, the other actually keeps us from it. Because one of them says, I am saved by grace alone. And the other says, I think I might still be able to be saved by works. I think I might still be able to present myself acceptable. Again, here's how Hebrews 8 describes Jesus. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest. One who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. A minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up and not man. If we go back to the beginning of the letter and the great announcement of Jesus' superiority, the author wrote, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So look at the language. After making purification for sins. So that means this is settled, it's finished, it's a permanent work. Sin has not only been paid for, it's been defeated. Which means the only power sin holds over us is the power we continue to give to it. We're going to hit this a lot in these next few months, but the author of Hebrews said that Jesus destroyed the devil. And yet we keep giving the devil credit for all kinds of stuff and keep living in fear and worry of him. And it says Jesus, past tense, destroyed the devil. 
The only power sin holds is the power we continue to give to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says that there is no temptation that any of us will ever experience that is anything other than that which is common to all of us. It's a little bit of a tough pill to swallow because we all think our situation is harder than somebody else's. Right, we can all explain why, you know, I, I, you, know you, don't, you don't know what it was like. You don't, you don't know how I was raised. You don't know what I was been through. And I'm not trying to diminish any of the reality of those things, except that the Scripture says, whatever you've been through, you've all been through it somehow, some way. Because here's what it comes down to, because there's one answer. One died for all. One died for all. Jesus offered himself once for all. We all have been given the same provision for all sin. Jesus paid it all. So no matter how much you've lived in or has been cast upon you, Jesus paid it all. It is paid for. Hear what Paul then writes then the next in uh, 1 Corinthians 10. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it again whoever wrote hebrews must have read paul because paul doesn't write about the difficulty of sin or the power of temptation he writes about the character of god right the author of hebrews has not been telling us about how difficult the situation is about how he understands their disappointment and their discouragement he has not been casting it aside he's just been telling them something greater than what they're going through jesus is better and so Paul says, everybody is tempted. There's always going to be temptation. But let me tell you something. God is faithful. Even in temptation, God is faithful. But not only is he faithful, he is sovereign. It says he will not allow us to be tempted beyond our ability. Doesn't that have to mean that God has power over the tempter? If he will not allow us to be tempted with more than we can bear, then doesn't God have to be the gatekeeper of everything that comes into our lives, even the temptation? So no matter where it came from, it came through God. That should change everything. That should calm our nerves. That should slow us down. That should change our minds. That should show us that when we panic, it's us giving in to our flesh rather than trusting God's character. But here's where his, fullness is, his faithfulness is on full display. With temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. Guys, that means that every time temptation comes, the Lord is present with it. Right? If he's providing a way of escape, that means every time. It doesn't matter if the devil himself comes. It means that there is a way that is being brought to us by the Lord himself. That's why the Philippians could say to us, the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. You could say, you don't know what I'm going through. I know this. The Lord is near. I don't know how hard it is, but I know the Lord is here. You don't know how many times this has happened, but I know the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. Trust his faithfulness. Every time temptation comes, the Lord is present. And in his presence, he brings the provision to overcome. And guys, what is that provision? It's not willpower. It's not some sort of religious or moral strength. It is not the right prayer at the right time. It is not speaking the blood or speaking this or speaking that. Here's the provision. He sits at the right hand of the Father, always making intercession for us. The provision to overcome is trusting in the intercession of Jesus that never stops happening. When I'm being tempted, Jesus is praying. When I'm falling, Jesus is praying. When my life is out of my control, it's in his hands. He's praying. I don't have to confess what I want. I have to trust what he's praying. Don't we see a glimpse of this in Luke 22 when Jesus told Peter, Satan has demanded to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail and when you return, strengthen your brothers. Jesus defeated sin by overcoming temptation. He paid for our sin by dying as our sacrifice, having no sin of His own. He ascended to heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father of the majesty on high. And He always intercedes for us to overcome sin. See, I actually believe that that's probably the power and the focus of Jesus' intercession in all of our lives. 
I believe that for you and me right now, wherever we are in life, he's praying that our faith would not fail. He's praying that our trust would increase, that our humility would grow. He's praying that our hope would be fully in him and that our dependence would be upon God so that our obedience would grow. He's praying from his perfection that we would be perfect. And here's the power of all of this. Because he endured temptation and didn't sin, because he offered himself as perfect, sinless sacrifice, because he laid down his life and took it up again, because he sits at the right hand of God making intercession for us, he is able to save us to the uttermost. He's not just able to save us from hell, he's able to save us from sin right here and right now. He's able to save us from our own flesh right here and right now. He's able to save us from the tempter right here and right now. He's able to bring us to God, to fill us with his spirit. He's able to make us perfect. And so to quote Peter, be ye perfect. Because you don't have to do the work. You don't have to do the work. You just have to trust the one who's already done it. Tonight, I think we need a change of perspective. We must aim for perfection. We must aim for what Jesus paid for and what Jesus is praying for. And so I ask as we finish, how do we become perfect? First and foremost, by putting our imperfection in his perfect hands. We've got to acknowledge it. We've got to stop covering things up and hiding. We've got to stop hoarding things that we hope for. We've got to live in his hands. We've got to, some, I know this is going to get me in trouble. We've got to stop making big plans for far off. We've got to stop trying to figure out where we're going to end up and how it's going to work out. And we've got to just put ourselves in his hands and believe today is the day of salvation. This is the day that the Lord has made. My job is to rejoice and be glad in it. My job is to obey him and to trust him, to lean into him. I can't worry about tomorrow. It will have troubles of its own. I have to be in him because he has promised to be in me. Let's pray David's prayer of Psalm 139 again. Search me and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. But here's the thing. As much as we need to be searched, we need to be taught. And so on top of that, let's pray tonight. Teach me to trust you. Teach me to obey you. Teach me to follow you. Teach me your ways. Teach me your heart. Ultimately, you know what we really have to pray because it is the first and greatest commandment. Teach me how to love you. Because our flesh does not know how. Our flesh does not know how to love God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength because our flesh is always holding something back for ourselves. We can't go on living in things Jesus chose not to live in. And we cannot go on living in things that Jesus chose to die so that he could set us free from. We have a better hope. We have better promises. We have a better covenant. All because we have a better priest. And so let's let him make us perfect by trusting him with all of our imperfection. Let's let him make us perfect by acknowledging and confessing our sin. Not only so we could be forgiven, but so that we could be changed. We can't be like Jesus if we aren't willing to stop being the way we've always been. He wants to change our lives. He lived and died so that we could draw near to God. Let's draw near to him tonight. Let's accept his invitation to perfection. Let's desire to live from him, through him, to him, and with him in all There's so much more, and I pray that the Spirit will teach you, and yet you'll go back to the Scriptures for yourselves. But here's where I finish tonight. We're supposed to be perfect. We have to learn what that means, and we have to long for it to be true. He did not die to make us better than we were. He died that we would be perfect so that we could draw near to God. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for desiring us. God, so often we've heard what we call the story of salvation so many times that I don't know that it means anything to us anymore. And yet it's more than the greatest story ever told. It's hard to imagine. God, when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
When we were your enemies, you sent your son that we might become your children. When, when we were stiff necked, you stayed soft hearted. When we rejected you, you bent down toward us. Jesus, thank you tonight for not giving in to your flesh. Thank you tonight for fighting the temptations that I give into so often. Thank you tonight for not making any room for the flesh, for not making excuses for bad behavior. Thank you for never wanting anything more than you wanted the Father and you wanted my salvation. And so tonight, God, do something in our hearts that changes everything. Do something in our hearts that makes us want you more than we want anything. Not Jesus and just Jesus. Believing that he's better. God, I pray tonight that your spirit would convict us of any sin that we've allowed to live in our lives. And I pray that the spirit would convict us of things that we've not been willing to call sin, even though you do. Convict us of all the places we don't trust you because that's sin. Convict us of all the places where we want, where we want acknowledgement because that's sin. Convict us of all the places where we're doing your will so that people will see us in a certain way. That's sin. Convict us of all the places where we've just chosen to harden our hearts until we get our way. God, would you teach us tonight how to trust you? Would you teach us tonight how to repent? Would you teach us tonight how to be perfect? And may we learn how to do this together. God, may we not be a people of scattered perfection. May we be a people of united perfection. A people who seek you together, who love you together, who follow you together. A people who want you together. Because you want us together. And so God, tonight I thank you for a better priest. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he's so much more. But he deserves so much more. And so finally, God, tonight I pray... I pray for me, and I'll let anyone else follow that wants. But I pray tonight that you would teach me how to love you the way you deserve to be loved. God, I don't want to love you the way I've seen other people love you. I don't want to love you the way I want to be loved. God, I want to love you the way you deserve to be loved. I want to follow you the way you deserve to be followed. I want to glorify you the way you deserve to be glorified. And so, God, I just ask you, have your way. Have your way. Because not only is it higher, it's better. Lord, thank you for my friends tonight. Thank you for the way that you are working in all of our hearts and all of our lives. Thank you for those that are here in the room and those who are not. Thank you that your desire for all of us is the same. It's perfection. But thank you that what you've prepared for all of us is the same. You've given us the power over sin. You have, you have paid for all of our sin. You have provided the way of escape at every time of temptation. You, God, are faithful to all of us at all times. And so teach us how to live for your glory instead of our perception of our good. God, I do love you. But I know it's only because you first loved me. Change us so we can look like you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Would you stand with me, please? If you need someone to pray with, please stop somebody, stop me. If you're online, you need someone to pray with, send us a message, I'll get back to you right away. But don't, uh, don't leave with your heart being stirred without dealing with whatever it is that God's stirring. Our benediction tonight is actually going to be the same passage that we focused on in intercession. Because there's nothing more perfect than Jesus being glorified. And there's no way to be perfect more than to live for His glory. And so Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. 
For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. God bless you guys.